So thank you so much. Uh, we, we, know people, we know we have people joining from, from, uh, from all over the world. And um, this is meant to be a sort of very lightweight round table conversation where everyone is invited to chime in um, during the session. And um, you can keep your cameras on or off, that's optional. Um, if you want, well, we'll start with the, with the housekeeping. So welcome, thanks for being here. Um, and on a note of housekeeping, if you want to, if you represent an organization or if you're part of a company uh, or part of a public uh, institution or anything of the sort, and if you want to represent that in the session, uh, you can add it to your name in Zoom. So how you, how you do that is you click your name um, and select to rename yourself. And um, that way other people know that you're representing an organization. If you're not, that's also fine. Uh, and we recommend you keep uh, Zoom in gallery mode so you can see other people. And um, we're going to ask you to, to, to remain muted by default because we know there's, uh, there's a lot of people coming in, into the room. And again, video is optional. The session is being live streamed and um, recorded. So we, we do ask you to bear that in mind. I mean, nothing confidential will be discussed as far as I know. Uh, but just keep that in mind if you do bring up, bring up something that you don't want to share. And um, we're going to do a quick round of introductions in a minute. And then we're going to host the conversation around uh, two roundtables. Each roundtable has sort of a different theme to it. And um, we'll get to those in a minute. And then we're going to sort of wrap up and try to see if we learned anything in this exchange. And... Um, my name is Michelle. I'm founder and CEO of Envisioning, and I'm currently in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And with me at the round table is Galdino, who will introduce himself. Yeah, uh, I'm Galdino. I'm Brazilian as well, but I live in Nuremberg, Germany. And to start with the interesting things about uh, the city I live in is a very, at the same time, a very historical city, but quite modern as well in terms of mobility. Yeah, and I guess my personal note about cities is that I've lived in six, uh, and uh, being Stockholm, São Paulo most of my life, but also Amsterdam, London, New York, uh, Amsterdam, London, uh, Berlin, and Milan, and um, so I do have a personal connection to cities that we'll get. Um, but we want to hear from you guys as well. So um, before sort of starting with the uh, with a topical conversation, uh, we're inviting everyone here at this at this table. Um, to um, unmute yourself and tell us who you are, where you're from, and something interesting about the city you're living in currently. There's no order to it, so um, whoever wants to go first, goes first. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're gonna start calling out people. What do you think about that? Yeah. So hi well, everyone. I live yeah. in Sao Paulo, and I think the interesting thing about the city is diversity. That's it. Thank yeah. you. I'm gonna call out the other ones with uh, with their cameras on. So Lucy. Yeah, can you hear me? Hi everyone. Um, Brazilian greetings from Germany. So kind of connection there. Uh, I mean, airport. It's a it's a quite a small uh, but but capital city in the province of Thuringia. And something interesting happening here is. Um, a kind of uh, urban gardening project that I have been able to accompany uh, to, to see uh, on the ground from, from the university that they are fostering this uh, urban gardening and bringing in people there to yeah, plant uh, together. Thanks for the, for the event and looking forward. Thank you. Sally, do you want to speak? Hi everyone, my name is Sally. I am part of uh, UNESCO, the Futures Literacy Team, but I'm currently located in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is my hometown. Um, actually, my hometown is Shanghai, and I've lived in Paris, so three different places. 
Um, but currently in Vancouver, and the interesting about Vancouver is that it pioneered this idea of Vancouverism, which is grounded on livability and sustainability. Um, so it's a it's a it's a very neat thing that a, a small city like Vancouver could be known around the world for this. And being in Vancouver, are you up early or late or both? Oh, I'm wildly early. Uh, it's 6 a.m. now, but I've been up since four. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. I'm sure others want to chime in as well. If you want to turn on your camera and join us. Hi, everyone. My name is Ana. I'm a Brazilian uh, living in Lisbon. And uh, there's lots of e initiatives uh, happening here, like we have um, a growing uh, startup ecosystem and lots of uh, things, lots of initiatives for uh, sustainability, because the now uh, Portugal is the um, 20. Yes, 2020 is a sustainable country and there's a, something like this happening here. Thank you. I think Henry wants to chime in. Hi, Henry. Hey, Michelle. Hi, my name is Henry. I'm living in London. Um, I guess the interesting thing for me about cities is, is whether people will stay in them or how many people will leave. Uh, hopefully that will make it cheaper for the rest of us who stay uh, in the cities and uh, it can regenerate them in interesting ways. Thank you. Rodrigo? Hello, I'm Rodrigo. I'm from Sao Paulo, but now I live in Amsterdam. Uh, I also work at Envision, in case you didn't see my, <laughs> my aura. Um, one interesting thing about Amsterdam, I love the city. I can, I can live with a bike and be anywhere I need in maximum 15 minutes. And something very interesting that's happening is uh, they are starting to implement the donut um, economy kind of thing from Kate. Um, so it's, I'm proud to, to be here in a moment where they're doing this kind of things. So circular economy and re regenerative uh, principles. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Thank Do you, you see that working in sort of, are there um, examples of that working already? Uh, they, I think, announced some plans on how to do it, but I haven't been following up uh, very closely. But a few months ago, they were uh, trying to limit how neighborhoods grow. I remember that part. Uh, and people are very much part of the, the decisions. So... A few weeks ago, we got a letter and we have to vote how they're going to use 300,000 euros in this neighborhood. If we're going to give more space for cars or more space for bikes or more space for people. And I thought that was incredible. I, I never had that to vote something like that in my life. So like micro democracy. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Marcella. Hi, I'm Marcella. Um, I've lived in 10 cities. Um, and um, in Latin America, North America, Middle East. And um, uh, one project that uh, we did at the, at, at the museum was thinking about the city as a place where food could grow. So we created the, the Biome Smart Farm uh, in collaboration with uh, different groups. Um, and that was an aquaponic uh, circular system. And then, and then um, we collaborated with a few people around that. So the idea of growing food in, in cities, right? So localizing production um, in small, unused uh, urban areas and in apartments as well. Hello. Nice, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the Museum of Tomorrow in Rio for those who don't know it. Nice. Does anyone here not live in a city? Hi, Divan Shu. Is that how you pronounce your name? Yeah, that, that's my name. Where are you calling from? from? Anyone here who doesn't live across the city. I didn't Hello. quite catch that. Can you repeat? Yes. Is anyone here who doesn't live across the city? 
this is the one I'm from India and I live in a village across the border so it lies on the Indo Pak border yeah so I'm a freelance and a cell designer to mention the organization and one very interesting thing about my city I would say is uh, somehow we have managed to preserve the knowledge that was left by our elders in the most stories and songs and all those rituals so if you are a harry potter fan you'll have lots of stories here full of magic and mythology but somehow the end moral will make sense to you so we also did a project around it uh transfer this knowledge to younger generations we took the most sensible and logical information and imbibed it into stories that are full of magic so that the moral is in line with the logic so yeah that's something thank you okay yeah thank you anyone else wants to tell us where you are and what your experience what your urban experience is like constanza hello sorry I, oh, your, your camera hi. just switched off so we're doing a round of hi we're doing a round of introductions uh, nobody really knows each other so uh, you're not alone in that and we're doing a round of introductions saying who you are where you're from and if there's anything interesting in the city you're in before getting the sort of the round table bit started so welcome Welcome, Sarah. Sarah might want to speak. Hello, um, everyone. My name is Sarah Cox. I am based in the northeast of England. Uh, my city is Newcastle. Um, I work in various innovation roles. Um, so uh, I'm an innovation manager at Innovation Super Network, which is a regional network of networks trying to bring together people to solve problems. Uh, we've just recently um, launched a COVID response challenge to um, fund and support innovative solutions to the challenges that are kind of the most pressing in our region. And I think one of the things that I like most about my city is that it's, you know, it's got quite a vibrant cultural scene, as many cities do, but it's also right next to the sea and um, sort of a lot of kind of agricultural and forestry land and, and mountains. So it's quite a nice place to be. It's not too far to get the best of both worlds where I am, luckily. Nice, thank you. Constanza, sorry for putting you on the spot. Do you want to speak now or? Yes, I was sorry. I didn't know if you were asking me to speak or not. Um, my name is Constanza. Um, I am currently temporarily in Lecce, Italy, which is in the heel of Italy, but usually based in London. Um, I work for Brink, which um, is a behavioral innovation organization looking at how we can embed innovation in how organizations, um, cities, and others work. And one interesting thing about my city is that there's lots of really lovely things. Um, it is one of the only cities in Southern Italy that has a Baroque architecture, and it is squeezed between two different seas uh, in the Mediterranean. Very well. Anyone else wants to introduce themselves to the group? There will be plenty of opportunity to speak. So if you want to get warmed up now, this would be a good time. Again, reminding everyone, this is an interactive session. We have virtually no slides. Uh, it's really about uh, hearing about um, everyone's urban experience in the innovation space. But um, well, given that no other faces are popping up, we'll, we'll get moving with the, uh, with the slides. And um, sort of a brief reminder of what, who we are and why we're doing this. So Envisioning is a foresight platform. We're sort of we're an organization dedicated to looking at uh, emerging technology and trying to make sense of where the world is heading from the lens of technology. Um, and our work is primarily open and public. So we do a lot of, um, all of our efforts are about getting the information out to the public and trying to engage with it and trying to um, trying to make a little bit more sense of where technology is heading, uh, given that it has such an effect on the, uh, on the future as it unfolds. And we took the opportunity uh, to work with, um, or to, to, to showcase our thinking with, uh, at the UNESCO Futures Literacy Summit, because we feel that it's, uh, it's highly aligned with um, sort of our view of trying to make technology intelligence a public utility or a public asset uh, we feel goes hand in hand with the intent of UNESCO to promote futures literacy as a competency for the 21st century, uh, especially because we think technology plays sort of an outsized role um, in how the future unfolds. 
And our work is highly methodological. It's very structured. Uh, we, we have set up a few additional sessions for those who want to do a deeper dive into how we do the actual research. Um, but the reason we brought up or we, the reason we're doing this session today uh, about cities is because for the last uh, few months, we've been um, developing this initiative, which we call Envisioning Cities, um, which is an attempt at documenting the technologies that are affecting uh, cities currently worldwide and trying to bring together a community of practice around these efforts. Part of it is because we all live in cities, uh, or most of us, uh, but also because we think that cities share challenges. Um, so Barcelona and Rio de Janeiro will face virtually the same problems uh, as will Leche, as will New York. Uh, so the problems facing cities tend to be more common than they are different. So we, we're, our thinking is, if we create a utility that through which we can document, describe, illustrate, and share the technologies affecting cities, perhaps we can help more cities make better decisions about the technologies in which they should invest in, um, in order to not be sort of stuck with uh, the solutions that they're familiar with, uh, and hopefully to sort of amplify the horizon of possibility of which technologies to implement. Um, to that effect, we launched an, initi an initiative uh, earlier this year called Envisioning Cities, and it's on cities.envisioning.io. There's plenty, it's all public, free, open, uh, and, and shareable. And what this is, it's a radar tool, which is our sort of the tip of the iceberg of our research. So the radar is where we showcase the, the technologies that we've found um, in our research process and um, where we share them in, in the form of this wheel. And here, what we have is listed uh, is hundreds uh, of technologies of different types of technologies. Some are, um, I mean, they're all at different stages of development, for example. So one of the things we do is we look at technologies as sort of uh, as a function over time. So we can present this piece of research as uh, in terms of its readiness or maturity level. So each technology exists at a different uh, TRL or technology readiness level, and that indicates whether the technology is an idea, whether it's a concept, or whether it's a product. And um, again, we're going to do much deeper dives into this in our method methodology talks later. But just so you know that when you're clicking around the radar, um, the things that are closer to the edges, like a synthetic external womb or a voting algorithm, uh, these technologies are still low on the readiness level. That means that they're still ideas or concepts. Whereas the things at the center, such as a wireless parking sensor, um, or for example, uh, WiMAX or 5G, solar powered waste compactors, all these urban innovations um, are fully available. They might not be available in your city, but they're available technologically. It means you can find a supplier somewhere in the world um, that is working on this and you can purchase it, you can, you can hire it, um, and so on and so forth. Um, the technologies are presented through a series uh, of lenses or points of view. Uh, one of them is, uh, for example, the, the domain to which it belongs. Uh, so we work with uh, about a dozen different domains, including waste and recovery, but also energy technologies, infrastructure, healthcare, um, culture and entertainment, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this is a nonlinear tool. It's meant for you to sort of spend some time on and make sense of at your own pace. And, uh, but it also serves as a backdrop for the talk we're having here today. So the idea is given that we are, tr we as an organization are trying to um, offer this tool to practitioners uh, or even urban dwellers working on uh, innovation to some extent, um, we're trying to offer this to the public. And in doing that, we also want to make sure that it's useful and to, to ensure it's useful or its utility, uh, we've promoted this talk today. And, um, and the talk again, it's it's going to be all about your experience. So we've really put this set this up as a roundtable, which is to say we have very little to add outside of the radar. I mean, we hope the radar speaks for itself, and it's it can be again it can be used and looked at at your own pace. We're not going to dive deeper into it. What we really want to do is um, hand a conversation over to you, literally uh, each one of you, and. Um, and we've set up a few themes as guideposts um, for this conversation. And the first one is technology in your city. And again, here it's your own experience that matters. We don't expect anyone to bring in slides or case studies, uh, although if you do have that, that's nice. Um, 
but the, the guiding questions are sort of what's one technology you wish you had in your city um, or what's a technology from your city that you think should be exported to others um, and keep it lively in the chat as well. And with that, that's really the, there's one more slide with, with the second round table uh, for, for a few minutes from now, but I'm gonna switch off the slides and we're gonna go back into sort of gallery mode. And again, I'm gonna invite uh, anyone who wants to speak uh, to turn on your camera and um, make your voice heard. So technologies in your city, what is one technology you wish you had, or what's technologies that you think others should adopt? So I can, I can say one. Um, in Rio, uh, there was the center of operations that was developed. It's more of like not one technology, but it's a, it's a process of looking at the city uh, and, and putting sensors out in, in various uh, uh, areas. But it's not only the technology itself, but it is also the process of joining together different groups to talk in the same area. So they met, you know, this was developed by the mayor, who now is the mayor again, Eduardo Paes, who will be the mayor again. Um, and it used kind of technology from IBM, et cetera, but uh, sensors all over the place. Um, and it was really put in because of this idea of um, there's a lot of dis you know, disasters with flooding and, and, and problems in, in, in kind of underprivileged areas. Um, but the cool thing about it is all the sensors combined with um, representatives from about 30 agencies of the municipality and, and the government uh, and the, the state uh, that talk together and would um, determine things together. That's a cool thing I think would, would be useful in other places too. Again, it's an open conversation. Hear? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an open conversation, and uh, we're inviting. It's going to be a very short one if you know, guys don't speak. Uh, I mean, we can talk about some Paul in Nuremberg for two hours, but I think it would be <laughs> interesting if we hear other um, voices. So do feel. Um, Hello. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I was just thinking about it uh, because uh, Rodrigo is also from Amsterdam, and he said a lot of things that I wanted to say. Uh, because I'm also from Amsterdam, um, but there is this initiative uh, which I think is in well, interesting. Uh, it's uh, maybe not necessarily technology, but it's sort of a uh, well. It it does it does uh, result in technological solutions. So it's an initiative the initiative called uh, the Knowledge Mile, and it's um, and it's a, uh, it's an initiative that uh, brings uh, the residents of one very long street in Amsterdam together. Residents, companies, students, universities that happen to be on that street. And they organize um, uh, regular meetings where everybody comes together and try to think how to improve the life on that particular street, which is, I think it's a very nice way to think about a city as a as in a micro spaces, like, like the one street where you can actually focus on tangible um, problems and, and then also figure out tangible solutions. Uh, so that's, that's what I, I think is really uh, good about my city. Um, and I wish, or maybe, oh yeah, I wish there was a bit more uh, of that, uh, but also in, in, in on even smaller scale, because I don't live in the center where that, that uh, initiative is happening. And I feel like my neighborhood perhaps is a little bit detached from all those smart solutions and exciting ideas and innovations, for example. So I think that if it was a bit more spread it, uh, not only about the, uh, and not only happening in the hip center, then that would be uh, that would be great for me as the resident as well. Yeah. Mani, 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 do you want to chime in? Um, actually, I wasn't planning to. I just turned my camera on to encourage other people to. Um, I, I think the the trouble I'm having with this concept is. Um, people are, are coming in with really good ideas and then I feel like, oh, I should probably be devil's advocate and kind of pick those ideas apart, right? So then I, I was just thinking about, I was like, oh, okay, the last idea was great, but the limitations I can see are this, this, and this. 
um, the first idea was great and I can see other limitations, but then I, I don't want to be the one to just chime in with like devil's advocate negativity kind of vibes. So I'm just going to turn on my camera and smile at people and then hope more people. Well, you're, more, you're more than welcome to deconstruct uh, some of these premises. I mean, we're trying, I think the, the, the angle is there are technologies and there are cities. Um, yep. And it doesn't mean that all technologies are good for cities. It doesn't mean that technology is good for cities. And I think the, I think the conversation can easily revolve around the issues that uh, are generated by tech as well, if that's your okay. perspective. So um, I'm, I'm from London. I'm Marnie from London, by the way. Hi, everyone. Uh, so the, the, the first point was, I believe, Lucia or Lucia. And um, uh, she, she mentioned um, smart cities in Brazil. Um, and I, I just wonder, there's, there's all these uh, different devices around the city collecting loads of data and information constantly. Where does that leave people's um, sense of uh, privacy? Is that like a constant invasion of privacy? Um, because I'm, I'm assuming like people's movements are also being recorded then the practical the practical issues of what happens with that data. There's there's such an abundance of data collected that um, uh, the 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 human uh, the human impact of that is people might feel like it's a little bit too invasive or like even logistically, what do you do with the data? Where does it go? And then um, the second uh, the second point was Ola, and um, uh, she mentioned individual streets but again like that if, if you if you go down to and I think it's a really cool idea but like stay somewhere a little bit bigger like London than Amsterdam um, it's about how do you break down uh, I'm, I'm guessing London's a little bit more uh, diverse than Amsterdam as well how do you break down barriers between individuals it's a really good in concept but how do you practically do that and then I believe like certain types of age groups and communities and races or whatever are going to be more engaged in the social aspect of that and other people who may not have the same uh, access to language or technology or um, uh, 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 the ability to communicate um, they might be neurodiverse or whatever they might be on the spectrum they're not able to communicate in the same way so then I feel like the, the loudest people were certain slices of society would dominate those conversations especially in areas of like gentrification um if certain people are moving in with their own ideas they would tend to dominate um uh, how those conversations would go over others who might not feel that they it's their place to to stand in a committee and and uh put those kind of ideas forward but again I'm, yeah i'm not trying to be negative there was just uh thoughts that i had on other people's ideas So are, are the concerns in general or specific? So when we talk about data collection in cities, is it a is it sort of a general concern or do you see, or do you see it being poorly used in um, either in London or elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, the, the trouble is if, if people put an idea forward to me, I start see, I'll, I'll see the benefits of it and I'll try and see where the holes are as well. So th these are like, unpolished unthought about ideas these are just like instinctual reactions to but I, I would have thought um I, I think london is the most uh cctv cameras per capita than like over anywhere else in the world right so it's just a it's a, it's a constant invasion of uh privacy it's a constant um it's a, it's a constant feeling of having the government stick their their nose into everyone's business and it just seems that um, from a technology perspective everyone's giving away their data and information these days anyway it, it feels like we might overstep the mark or may have overstepped the mark already in terms of um, have we completely given up privacy and then if, if there are these little uh, monitoring devices all over the, the city to measure parking or to measure environment or temperature or whatever it may be um, is is that is that too much information from everyone? Should we just let stuff happen organically sometimes? 
Uh, I, I just wanted to say that um, on that point, actually, with pri privacy is a very, very big issue in smart cities. Well, uh, with all the sensors that you mentioned, for example, in Amsterdam, there is a new, uh, there's going to be a new sensor installed to measure uh, loudness of particular street or a neighbor or like a square in a neighborhood. And um, there was a lot of concern about like, so how exactly does this sensor work? Because it seems to be recording uh, and analyzing what it what it hears as well, because the 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 sensor is also meant to recognize a, a sort of like an aggressive sounding behavior, like, yeah, aggr aggressive behavior through the sound as well, which is very very uh, yeah it could be very very much of an infringement of on privacy on on uh, just you know recording the citizens like uh, um, yeah like. Uh, yeah, basically spying on them. Uh, but there are some also the, some uh, uh, grassroots initiatives to um, install sort of like, a, for, for example, in, cam uh, in camera recordings uh, to install some sort of a blockade on, uh, on image. So it does recognize the human being, right? But it, it, and immediately when it recognizes, like the, with the object recognition, it uh, assumes a filter on that person. So yes, you see a, a human being, you see the outlines, uh, but you cannot identify who it is exactly. And that really works well, for example, for cameras that are already meant to, yes, recognize the dangerous, danger behavior, dangerous behavior and send in police officers there. That's already actually installed in a lot of cities and including uh, Amsterdam, uh, but without uh, pinpointing which person who is uh, yeah, who is ex exactly on the uh, video. So that's I think it's sort of like a uh, well direct like we are. It seems to be shifting towards in, uh, towards uh, identification into just uh, um, let's say that um, realization of what is happening. It's just yeah. So there are some, maybe there are some, uh, yeah, hopeful initiatives uh, where we can, yeah, fight that privacy issue. Um, but I think that uh, one thing that's interesting about that is that, you know, it's not just the face or, you know, anything like that, but, you know, for example, um, CCTV cameras and, I mean, in China and, and stuff like that, they can identify people by the way that they walk, you know? So it's, it's not the fact that you know of identify and, and from very far away, from very far away. So so it's not the case of like identifying by by closing the face or you know by by whatever, but it's the government not saving that information and not using it in a certain way. So I think you know um, in places where China that they make um, they make kind of a difference between you know pri privacy versus healthcare or education or social good, social good, you know, what is a good citizen? Um, it's those kinds of value judgments from, from the government because from the technology, you can do it by many different ways. It's, it's what government is there. And then, you know, how do you, how do you plan for, you know, it to be there beyond governments because, you know, one government can enter um, and they could have a, you know, very kind of privacy oriented view. Another one can be like, no, we need to know this kind of stuff. We need to have social measures. We need to like kind of, you know, find people for jaywalking as they used to do in the U.S. and all these kinds of things. So, so I don't know. I think I think it's like how how do you how you protect these systems from use when these systems already give you information that you need. You just need to want to use them or not, and that's a big question. Yeah. Again, to to both of you, um, thanks for the reply. I I feel like it, it boils down to who's in control of the information and then. Uh, how openly is that information being used or how openly is are those implementations of those uh, uh, data gathering devices being put in place? Like, did it, was everyone aware of them? Does everyone know that what the consequences are? Does anyone even care? Um, and then I feel like uh, it's like you, you were saying, Lola, about the um, faces potentially being blurred out or whatever. The... The in theory, the, the information isn't there. People's faces are blurred out. However, the most corrupt people, the, the the people who have access to it, are the most likely to be corrupted by it and and be able to be powerful enough to use it for for um for for uh, tracking people down, for example, or whatever. Um, so that that 
is a bit of a concern, right? So the yeah. only people who have access to that information yeah. are potentially the most corrupt. Yeah, so I think it boils down to accountability in the end. So it's not that, but technology, we, with technology, we can do as much as we want. There's no limits to it. But it's up to us to figure out who's going to be held, uh, held accountable and how can we ensure the transparency of what is happening? And that is going to be in increasingly more difficult with automation, right? Because it's going to be less and less in hands of um, uh, people. But and then again, people who will be able to uh, actually use this technology will be, uh, you know, who will have be, uh, well, let's say, um, technologically smart to that, that level might ha hold too much power so in the end we are really actually looking at who is uh, who's going to be uh, who must be held account accountable and how can we ensure that we can look at their hands basically at all times so that's uh, yeah i agree with you on that point yeah but would that be enough to leave cities for example money like you live in a city but would you leave cities because of that Um, yeah, I mean, it's really weird if you look at human behavior, like there's a, I was thinking about this the other day, so that they're, they're uh, in primary schools, which is, I believe, like five to eight years old, nine years old in, uh, in the UK now, they're bringing in um, measures, I believe, where they, uh, they, they teach kids about um, like the process of, of being trans or like uh, being in the the LGBTQ community, and uh, I know there's a lot of people up in arms that are actually like ready to up stakes and move to other countries because of that, because they they, they don't want that imposed on their children, right? So if, if you take that as an example, of people will actually move if they they feel like they're really um, uh, 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 their, their ecosystems really changing, but I feel like those people are uh on the um on the fringes of society in general i, I don't know who, who who is likely to move because they fr they put some more cameras up or they put some more robots up like you're going to rationalize it in your head as well we haven't got an option anyway it doesn't make a difference we're not going to to move and most normal people will do that but again it's like uh people are just finding finding out about how uh data has been used and abused by a uh, tech companies because I've got a couple of documentaries on Netflix like that information was readily available for years before but uh, no one bothered to look into it so unless it's made very apparent to people they'll be up in arms in it and uh, like uh, changes in the law and whatnot won't take place and especially with technology the law is going to be so it's, it's going to be like 10 years behind the actual technological developments anyway so whatever happens in that 10 years is is kind of uh that innovation is going to solidify and then it might be too far gone for anyone to be able to change uh, what, what happens. So again, it, it, it comes down to personal preference, but it comes down to openness and transparency. You can be transparent, but then does your audience understand what that, what you've just told them means, what the actual consequences are of it? Lucy? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I do have a point to make coming from, from perhaps a bit of a different background than you guys. Um, you're talking about technology in the city. And then uh, we have been discussing, okay, the, the problems and uh, the, the, the risks regarding certain technologies and also several opportunities that they have as well but I want to, to do a step back and, and think about the city and, and think the technology not as, as a goal of, of having technology in, in the city uh, but as the means to achieve certain things and what I miss is that um, or what I wish technology could help me is to really figure that out with everyone involved and uh, and a city is a place that is very innovative. It's about human relationships. It's about um, 
human uh, quality of life and there are many things that are important in the city that can be uh, yeah improved with technology but i think it's about really uh, um, uh, the process of everybody deciding it so i see a lot of potential for the participation of people in, in that sense that's what i wish for my city for instance that we can engage more with each other and and design a city that is uh, a common vision for everyone and that's where i see that uh, technology could help but not like uh, the technology for 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 its own sake and um um i i wish we could have cities that are empowered to do that because the thing is that the cities are not choosing the technologies the cities are the, the technologies are coming and cities cannot have this governance aspect so this is i think also another very crucial issue how we support the local governments that are making certain decisions for for delivering services that's that's another point of of my what i wish for the city that cities uh, services are being improved uh, with technology so um and that's something that is uh i think uh, very very uh yeah still lacking but but there are like these two fronts right so there is the city and then there is the technology and how technology can be, make city um uh, yeah more uh more livable and so on but it's also about the yeah the risks also in that regard and uh, i leave it to that <laughs> Yeah, no, I like I like what you're both uh, saying. If someone uh, also wants to jump in, just just raise your hand. But uh, like, uh, is is as most is it is almost as if uh, there are two different speeds. So like the the tech companies and the technological development had like a, a, a one speed that is just fast and just trying to put products and, and new possibilities out there, while legislation is much slower. And the decision making that we are used to is not as fast as the technology managed to, to be. Maybe another like a bigger example that is like on national levels uh, is like the way we deal with social media and the spread of misinformation that affected the elections in many countries in the last couple of years. And maybe now we are starting to catch on uh, like especially considering like we have people from the UK here where uh, we had the Brexit that where we had a lot of, of misinformation going on back in the uh, when the election was going on, the US, Brazil as well. So one, one I, I like this 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 aspect of the, the discussion. Uh, anyone that wants to to share any other technology they wish their city had or any technology they would like to, to share? So yeah, please. I just wanted to comment on what Lucy and what you said. I think that, you know, from, from my vantage point of, you know, being closer to cities uh, uh, here, um, the, the, the municipality of Rio and stuff, what I see um, is that, you know, what, what you guys both said, you know, technologies are brought to the cities, but rarely cities think in a strategic way about what they want their future to be like. And so the Cisco will come or IBM will come or you know, Siemens will come and they'll say, hey, we have this great new technology, let's put it in there. And then so they put it in there. And then, and then depending on, on what administration is there, it's either used or not used or kind of left to, to die, you know, as, as happened with the, the, the center in a certain way. So I think it's a very big problem there. Like, you know, if, if you can't imagine what this future is that you want, like if you can't, what is the world that we want as a city? Like, do you want, do we want the city to be inclusive, to be respectful of privacy, to um, have different uh, social groups here, to, to have opportunities for different people, you know? Um, I think that cities that think about those kinds of things, you know, I mean, not, maybe none of them are thinking super well about these, but like at least Amsterdam, Paris with a 15 minute city, um, other places with the city, the idea of like you being able to travel across the city, those are concepts. They may not be the, you know, maybe we find out that donut economic economy and 15 minute city are not the ideal concepts, but at least they're concepts for a future of what the city is. And then you have like, okay, this is what we want. We want everybody to be able to do everything they need within 15 minutes of a bike ride. Um, and that's a concept because that means that you're changing you know, all you're putting in bike paths, you're putting in, you know, kind of, you know, different zoning uh, uh, requirements in different areas. 
So I think that, that that to me is a thing that that most um, worries me about about the the cities is that nobody has very few have an idea of what this could be, right? So I think I with that, say, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say we can. Uh, the, I mean, we're on time to move to the second topic. So I'm pulling up the slides for round for for the second roundtable. And again, these are arbitrary, but they're meant to sort of spark the conversation in a certain direction. And what we what we proposed for the second half of the conversation is around emerging technology scouting. So, like, how do you find out about what's going on in cities outside of your own? Um, so given, you know, given COVID and given that we might not even, might not even be out on the streets very much, um, in general, how do you learn about new technology? How do you learn about what's going on around the world? And how do you know what's applicable and what isn't, if that makes sense? Yeah, considering, consider everybody's here because uh, uh, we would assume that everyone has like one, at least uh, one level of interest on, 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 on innovation in the urban environment. So where are you looking for... Uh, innovations in that 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 way, and we would like to basically share with everybody and and increase our, our collective knowledge, let's say. And if you have like something specific, please, uh, yeah, put in the in the chat there. Actually, I would like to respond to an earlier comment, and I'm sorry because you just did the transition to the next question, but I will I'll try to tie it in. Um, a technology that I would like to see is not one, but maybe considering the concept of technological plurality. Um, if we think about crafting a common vision, how is that different than from conventional master planning in which um, technocratic architects come together to design a city and then it's built by engineers um, and somehow people are supposed to live in it. But we've seen this um, fail again and again in cities across Europe, um, in the suburbs of North America. Um, so it, so when, when we talk about a common vision or a common future, it seems to imply a singular future. Um, but I think plurality and the diversity of futures in our imaginaries is important to emphasize upon. And I do think that cities tend to have visions um, and strategic ones at that, um, it's not always, I think, enterprises imposing themselves into cities, but cities competing for um, the, the promise of singular large platform companies um, that they could potentially bring to the local economy. If we think about um, how cities ran bids for Amazon's second headquarters, um, that was a very fierce competition um, and cities were openly inviting this to occur. So um, maybe maybe just for a way for us to think about um, what, how plurality fits all of this in. And also the Toronto, the Toronto experience with the waterfront project that thankfully did not move on. But yeah, like the platform companies owning cities is, is probably not a good idea. Yeah, for example, uh, in Amsterdam, Amsterdam Smart City Initiative is is uh, is founded or co-led by the Economic Board of Amsterdam, and that's been a, a topic of uh, controversy because, yes, indeed, it seems like they're representing in a lot of those ideas uh, the Amsterdam Smart City is actually leaning towards making the smart city more. Uh, available uh, for grabs, <laughs> I'd like to say that like this, by big companies. So that's that's been, um, but they are sort of, it is a very, very difficult relationship because they are very much open to the public. They lead a lot of open meetings where everybody can come in and sort of pitch in. But I do feel like the threshold for change is actually much bigger for a regular citizen than, uh, of course, a, a huge company. So it seems sort of like a like a like smoke and mirror situation where where you pretend that you're giving the platform to the citizens and to to small organizations where in reality uh, the smart city is actually being pushed forward by bigger companies so i think it's uh, i think you might be right on that um, definitely and um, yeah it seems to be a problem everywhere in these days yeah i think you both made some really like strong points um, like, for example, take this meeting, uh, 
Michelle and Galdino have gone and organized everything, but there's only a, th a few people that are going to speak up, right? Most people don't want to speak up, therefore no one's turned their camera on or whatever. Um, those dominant voices are going to be, the, this is my point earlier, my, those dominant voices are going to be the ones in control and they're going to lead the entire conversation. Now, I'm sure everyone here has got amazing ideas and amazing uh, concepts to bring to the conversation. Yeah, it's not their style to speak out. Therefore, we're never going to hear what they say. And like just some of the structures, the the ways in which, uh, uh, to Sally's point, um, in which some of these uh, organizations or tech companies or whatever are, are being brought in and some of us going from the top, top down, um, just in like, in back offices, in dodgy little meetings where stuff happens, um, that that really does affect everyone, and yet not everyone's going to have a say in that. But also to answer the the second point is um, uh, where I look for information. I just like the brave people in society, right? It doesn't matter what what aspect they're in. They might be the entrepreneurs, they might be the artists, they might be the creatives, because generally it comes from uh, the grassroots up. And again, it's just it's just the brave ones who are not afraid to talk that are getting a lot of the innovations within any city uh, made and done. And then often are quite are quite fine, uh, are fine quite often even that uh, from top down. Like for example, I'll I'll give in London, uh, like Russian and Arab and Chinese investors are coming into like up and coming cool areas like the the gentrified areas and then buying up all the land and then they they create new flats so what happens is that area was once cool it was filled with cool people in their nightlife and they were generating culture that's what made that that part of the town cool or for want of a better word worth moving into and then all of a sudden everyone else has jumped in all the business people have jumped in and then those areas and those clubs and th that culture gets uh, strangled really quickly. And that's happening in London nightlife, or it's happened already in, in London nightlife. And it happened in uh, New York during Giuliani's era. So basically all, all of the clubs and all of the, the, the places where these people tend to gather in order to share ideas and concepts and make stuff happen, they don't exist anymore. So if, if, if they're getting strangled by a top-down... Um, by uh, top-down involvement, then uh, it really leaves me to believe that um, like cities like London culturally are gonna die out pretty quickly if uh, if that keeps on happening, especially where uh, the culture comes from is, is from the grassroots up. So I think two points. Uh, first, there's a question on YouTube to you, Mani, uh, which is why you're so sure that legislation will always be late to deal with technology. Uh, and while we think about that, uh, there's also the you so mentioning you mentioned that a few vocal uh, like the, the the opinion of a few vo of, a, of a vocal minority um, will outweigh that of the majority, and I think that's it's representative. It also reminds me of the 1991 rule, if you haven't heard of that, which is of a hundred people joining in in an online conversation, say 90% will be lurkers; they'll just listen in and hear what other people have to say. 10% uh, will be, I guess, engaged, and 1% will be sort of heavy contributor, like heavily contributing. So I think that's, it's, it's inherent um, in any conversation that most people will just be listening in, whether that's 80-20 or whether that's 91. Um, but, um, but to the point of why, why are you sure, or why do you think legislation will always be late to deal with technology? Yeah, okay, so, uh... In technology, for example, right now, they've got the biggest brains and they've got the most money uh, going, right? So they're, they're the big industries. The guys uh, running technology all use stuff like design thinking, user-centered design. Their, their concepts that they apply ideas and technologies to the world are much more advanced than, um, uh, for example, the, the ideas that governments are using. Governments tend to use uh, well, in Britain anyway, 100-year-old bureaucratic systems and infrastructures um, th that have been in place for ages. They've got loads of competing government departments. Um, everyone wants their shine. Everyone wants... Uh, like, it's all power plays between departments. So it's not a unified um, uh, concept that everyone's aiming for and working together within. 
Whereas tech companies, they tend to have small, very lean teams um, that can iterate on processes and just work out every little niggle. Um, they're like highly, highly uh, skilled and highly streamlined. Uh, they've got like uh, neuroscientists and all sorts like tapping into every little aspect of how people's minds work. So they can iterate and innovate way quicker then a, a, a government is going to be able to catch up with them. So generally, you, you, the government's been around for a long time and they've been built a certain way. They've got the old structures of, of doing things. And that's why innovation within government is really hard to do because they've got so many competing voices and um, so many clashing egos and such archaic systems that innovation isn't going to happen within government. So for, for 60, 70 year old men, to be able to understand how the world is functioning right now um, and the uh, the rapid innovations within society right now, they're not ju they're just not going to be able to get their head around it because that's that's not where they came from. Um, in um, in the UK, for example, uh, most most of the government have gone to the top schools and the top universities and stuff. And if you've been trained to think in a certain way, that's been around for hundreds of years and you've built empires on those systems of thinking you assume those systems of thinking are the most uh the, the strongest foundations to build upon whereas actually uh, you need constant innovation and you need uh, survival of the fittest and technology and business have discovered those new uh like technologies or mental frameworks to think about stuff in order to to be way ahead of the curve that's the nature of what they do is is to be ahead of the curve so that's why i would answer that um, and the other one about Pareto's rule or uh, the 90, 10%, it's, it's just the way it is. Some, some people are going to out-talk other people. That, so like uh, having anonymous elections about stuff is the way to go. Whereas not everyone in that election who's actually voting is going to understand the concept. So that's, the, uh, that's, that's another problem with uh, the, the way stuff uh, is, democ uh, is democratised or whatever. So yeah, like I mean, I'm no expert. I just I just feel like I've got instincts towards certain things, and um, I I know that most people won't talk up in conversations, and other people need to talk up in conversations to kind of cover the slack. But I I know everyone else in this room right now in this chat has got amazing ideas and amazing concepts to bring to the conversation. It just so happens there's a couple of extroverts in there, and they're dominating. So I mean, it's just the way it is. This this is literally like. Uh, a, a, a micro uh, a micro ecosystem of what we're talking about the in what that happens in government in general anyone else tracking technology as part of your day job or part of your personal interests I can say a couple of words about Calgary. Um, we have a resilient Calgary strategy and being a future focused Calgary is a cross cutting theme. And we're looking at a corporate wide strategic foresight program to help with that. Right now we do have project uh, pockets of foresight studies where we'll um, study the future of, you know, a certain domain, whether it's, you know, operational workplace centers or policing or our, greater downtown. Um, but we are trying, you know, looking at how do we tie all those pieces together, um, perhaps with a, you know, with a technology to help with that, you know, with a platform so that we can, you know, house and share data, like the wonderful backdrop that you have there um, with envisioning um, so that all of our employees and leaders can access that information. It's not limited to, to the project team. And then we've also since, especially since COVID started a corporate wide scan club where we have representatives from each department and key teams in our city um, come together. You know, it's, it's varied between weekly and monthly depending on other things happening at the city to talk about signals of change. Um, and really with a kind of an open, um, I guess, question in terms of what could impact our city, our city services, our businesses and our communities over the next 15 years and to understand that um, and then have those, those, those conversations. We also have an innovation lab which also explores different ideas and they have 
you know, lunch and learns, mug clubs, tiger team events to explore ideas as well. And then I put some comments in the chat about kind of our strategy. I think, I mean, cities don't lack strategy. I mean, we certainly have a lot, um, but it's a matter of, I guess, tying that together with investment and then being able to, to sustain that over time. Thank you. I see near face, Carl, do you want to chime in? Where in the world are you? Um, I'm in Berlin. Uh, maybe I have some thoughts to the point, I, I forgot the name that was uh, mentioned before. Uh, I think the government, yeah, maybe they don't drive innovation, but I think it's a key function of the government to, yeah, um, to provide places where innovation can happen. I think, yeah, that's very important. Thank you. I have a bonus question. Does anyone want to leave cities? Like given that remote work is most likely the new default, does it make sense to stay in the cities? Uh, I can say for myself, for example, during the pandemic, I realized that uh, living in the city without the benefits of living in a city is actually a mental torture <laughs> for me. So uh, I realized that my experience of the city really much depends on, on um, uh, yeah, on being uh, able to 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 meet with people and to actually enjoy uh, everything that uh, Amsterdam can uh, that that provi Amsterdam provides. So I I do have to say that uh, yeah, I definitely realize how much uh, being in the nature right now it actually <coughs> works so much better for me. So yeah, I, I I was considering well, me and my friends, for example, we have this. Uh, uh, idea of of getting some land now, which we never we would never thought about it before. But just because of the pandemic, it's actually in our heads all the time of getting some land and becoming a, a well the idealistic version of farmers. So <laughs> I guess that's uh, yeah that's um, well that that's that for me. Yeah. Anyone else wants to de-urbanize? Yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, hey, my good. But I can, I can share some thoughts too. <laughs> it's really good to, to be able to reach everything and catch up with everything people were talking here on the, on the chat as, as well. And I agree with Walla uh, mentioned that I am also living in Amsterdam and I realized that like I'm Brazilian and I'm living in Amsterdam and then the city is, is really expensive and uh, like the the, uh, the rent and then all the, the structure. But then actually in the moment you are not using all of that, you are only inside of your apartment. It's like, why I, I, uh, I need to be like, in the same neighbor, or maybe like we start, we start to question that. Uh, I had all, already the, the same idea you mentioned, like to to be able to to maybe live a little bit far from the city, but to have access to well to the reality around the nature and, and everything else. Uh, but then this was an idea that everyone was saying, "Ah, oh, you're crazy! Ah, oh, the opportunities are not going to be there." And then suddenly, it's really nice to to hear more people talking about that. I have a lot of friends in, in, in Brazil uh, still and hope to keep <laughs> my friends in Brazil. And they, uh, most of them that were living in, in Sao Paulo but were not from there, were just there like working in a big company. Like I have many different uh, friends from different places saying that I oh, actually I came back to, to live in my city with my family or I just uh, rented a new apartment in, uh, to myself back to my city, like in, in the northeast of Brazil or in the south of Brazil, uh, going going back to their uh, hometowns, because today we are working online. So if you have internet, why you are paying like a, like three times 
uh, the same amount of, of rent in another in another city and about to leave cities i think this is a, a amazing point and also about like there is something that is less technological but uh, there is also this field around that uh, you feel immersed in the opportunities and in the conversations but when you are not there because things are not happening actually like physically around you also don't feel that you don't feel immersed in the opportunities or in the the context you are where the things are happening online, for example, in a, in a forum like this. So you need to reallocate yourself, not only physically to a different city, but also to uh, like to scout different routes, online routes, to be able to be in the right places, because maybe this group will not be in the same city, but they have the same interests, interest, interest uh, than you like you. So this is what come to my mind. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Devanjo, uh, did I spell it correctly? Uh, do you want to share your experience? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So I actually did move away from the city kind of two years ago. And the reason was, so I say, if you're not living in the city, you must be living in a village or a town. So experience that villages and towns, uh, the time of uh, kind of time moves very slow, you know? Cities are rushed and fast paced. So I experienced that uh, almost in cities and town, uh, villages and towns, the changes are much more evolutionary. You know, the towns adopt as per the need the time. But in cities, the changes are very forced, forced by companies pouring in, by populations pouring in, uh, forced, uh, let's say the cities want to be cities, so the changes are very much forced onto them. But in villages, the changes are evolutionary and are very much in line with the people, you know. So in smaller uh, places, you may not find people who are having a hard time to cope up with the changes. But in cities, it's very common. So I like, moving back to village or town was very much peaceful. And so everything moves as per the need. We don't complain as much as we used to do in the cities. And technology, even the adoption to technology is as per the need and also not as per what we want, but as per what we need. So I think, yeah. So if you, if you leave technology and think about other parameters, I think villages or towns would be much more advanced than cities. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Heather. One thing I'm really excited about with, you know, exploring trends like urban exodus and what it means for cities is, you know, for cities to rethink what is our competitive advantage and what do we offer? And it is, you know, some cities have declared, you know, 15 minute cities and offering services that are close to one another, having that sense of vibrancy. Um, and then also what are, you know, where are we lacking or why are people meet, you know, and, moving perhaps and is it access to nature can we do more to bring nature into cities and to provide open spaces and places for people to to actively and passively recreate in our city um, so you know, being able to reframe and rethink um, some things we do and and place greater emphasis on them as a result of this I think is you know it's a, it's an opportunity for cities right now Yeah, I also feel that uh, these opportunities need like a, a different, um, like they have different key metrics. Like when we are talking about opportunities, for example, to a business, like I think it was money that mentioned that uh, the, because in companies things are faster and they have a, like lean teams. Uh, but then we also see different, for example, we have some, uh, some uh, cities that, uh, the mayor became like the, 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 the CEO of a company, said, I'm not a politician, I am the, the CEO of a company and I'm gonna rule this company, but uh, this city. But what started to happen is that we started to have this place that people uh, stopped to be citizens. They started to be like consumers of that structure. So it's like a completely different like, like language, key metrics, ideals. And it's really nice to be talking here together with a group that, is trying to see actually 
how we connect with these people, not only like we're using the same metrics as for companies, but for actually cities. And like, I, I really like the, the, the initiative to, to, to start to bring like the approach and the, the applications for technologies in this, this context. Any, any further opinions? If I might jump in again, <laughs> I've been thinking a lot. It's quite, quite nice to have this discussion. Um, so I think that we will have to to become, uh, um, yeah, used to the idea that cities will change now. The digitalization process, all the this, what is being uh, becoming more visible through the pandemic as well is showing that uh, we need to think of cities in a different way and that the room, the, the city as a room for, for, for the space for, for connection might be different in, in the future if you need less transportation, if you need less space for, for office and so on. So this is, I think it's in the hands of the, the, the designers and the, the planners of the city to to have in mind to still make cities attractive, not to see that to say that we have to move out of cities, but also what Heather said, to offer more things in the city that make city livable and make city a good place to be as well. And I think there is a good opportunity in there. And the other thing that I was thinking was actually, how can we make use of technology to perhaps also slow down the growth of cities at some point to make villages and the surrounding, the peri-urban areas still attractive and, and uh, so that the pressure on cities is also diminishing because I think this is what, when we think about the, 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 the prognosis that uh, 200, 2050, uh, uh, three more billion people is moving to cities. I don't know, it's really huge. And then you have to think about the secondary and, and like the smaller cities around bigger cities and how you connect them better, how you make them attractive for people to live outside, but still have the possibility to uh, use the amenities of a bigger city and so on. So I think this is quite quite a promising area in the future so that we, we look at, at uh, um, smaller cities around the, the, the bigger cities or um, yeah, in, in, in this spatial planning as a regional planning as well, not only uh, looking from the city, but from a, a broader perspective to include the villages and smaller cities also so that uh, they are attractive and people can stay there. They don't have to move to cities. So not people moving out, but people don't having to move in as well. So uh, I hope you get my point. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think that was a really interesting point, Lucy. I think what happens is, um, what's happening in London is market forces are driving the prices of everything up so high anyway. And um, the implementation of technology, like there's a, there's a high-speed railway in uh, being built from London that gets to all parts of the UK really quickly. So I, I feel like what's going to happen pretty soon is People, people are just going to migrate out of London, especially artists, the creatives, the, the people who actually drive innovation. Uh, they're going to move out of London into smaller little towns and cities, which happen to be on this railway. And um, also right now, every, everyone's working from home anyway. Everyone can see the possibilities of, of that now uh, to be like a digital nomad. So uh, I believe that what you just suggested has been accelerated by uh, lockdown and Corona. But I feel like in London, it was happening anyway, just because of the prices being so ridiculous um, that no one can afford to live here anyway. And there's a lot of like empty apartments just being held um, as, a, as a, 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 a cost inflating um, tactic by a lot of developers, which is uh, artificially affecting everything within the city. So if it's happening in London, I'm sure it will happen in other towns soon enough. Perhaps one more thought that I was having while you guys were discussing. Um, um, it, it's uh, another, uh, maybe another issue, but it's about, we were talking about the difficulty of having like quite agile and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, very, very rapid transformation on the, on the private sector and uh, also the, the, the likes 
the startups and the big tech companies having a very yeah speed in the in this in this um, providing solutions and so on. And on the other hand, government as as a very slow and very bureaucratic uh, yeah institution. And I wonder if we need like a kind of a broker as as an institution in between these two. That also has the, the the yeah the the concerns and the interests of the people in their mind, and and they are able to like to facilitate this process because I think this is also about this like how how the forces and market forces and all kind of interests are being run in the city and who has uh, ability to say something at the right place or with the right people or not and who could be these people i mean who could be such a kind of a broker that has this this kind of uh, overview of the interests and and is able to yeah to connect even if the government is not so agile but is able to to bring in some speed because we don't have the time i mean and the things are happening and and, and in the end it's about to, yeah, do we have a, a Chinese model everywhere where there is a complete, uh, yeah, o overview and control of the citizens, or are we able as citizens also to um, to steer it a little bit and to to, uh, to trust the, the the institutions as well? So I'm not sure if this is uh, the right place to think to think about it, but this is uh, bo bothering me a lot because I don't see no one doing this. Uh, sorry, but you mean like a sort of an advocate for, for, yeah, right? Okay, it it can be some it can be an advocate, but it should be someone with a bit of a stronger mandate somehow. It, it's mm -hmm. it's hard. I don't know if there is there is it's possible to have someone with such a mandate, but it could even be yeah some social uh, coming from from bottom up, right? Uh, the the from from people, but it's I don't know. I'm Maybe just spinning off. What what would we need? Yeah. Because I like your, like, I definitely agree, uh, but I think it's it's yet another intermediary between people and technology. So I feel like it comes down to the issue of digital literacy and uh, yeah. allowing uh, the tools, the tools to, to, to learn about what is actually happening to be more accessible to, uh, to everybody. But yeah, I think I, th I definitely feel like there's a need for such a person, but I think there's, uh, if we reinstate more and more steps between the actual uh, technology and, and the people, then I don't, I'm not so sure if it's actually encouraging to, to even, uh, uh, for encouraging the conversation, but rather making another step to, uh, you know, uh, yeah. making the distance even bigger, I would say. Yeah, there's another point as well. Like, uh, if it's not on an, uh, if it's not governance on a national level, then it might be on a city-wide level and stuff like that. In Amsterdam, where, oh, sorry, Berlin, where I think they banned Airbnb, as far as I can remember, and um, somewhere like in Paris, where they banned Uber. Um, I don't know how technically um, how actually uh, accurate that is, but like when cities come in and ban technology coming in I, I think that is a, a good example of that but is it progressive or is, is there, what are the reasons behind it what is the the thinking behind it like in Berlin they were doing it because it it destroys the culture of the city right and turns it into a tourist trap which is like a perfectly good reason to do something whereas in Paris maybe it was more of a financial decision uh, so uh, that might not have been as uh, productive an intervention for them to have made but again these these guys are out here to disrupt that's literally what they they say every single time is we're creating so the the inevitable fallout of disruption is going to be a lot of people are, are damaged by what these companies are doing and how they're doing it so uh, yeah it's a really good point but how how is that regulated and how how is that infrastructure put in place it's an interesting question Move fast and destroy things. Yeah, move fast and break things no longer works as a slogan, thankfully. Mm -hmm. And I think people are realizing that it was never a good idea in the first place.
I mean, I think we're, we're also wrapping up this conversation. Um, we have joining us Raphael, who lives in Paris and who is a city expert and who listened into the last few minutes. Um, I don't know if you have any, any words on the technological situation of Uber or other um, sort of um, disruptive organizations in Paris. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. I, I, I actually just joined the meeting. So I haven't heard much of your conversation. I just heard that you were speaking of Paris. And so uh, um, maybe the person who was just speaking can repeat a little bit there so that I can bounce on it because yeah, I'm based in Paris. I'm a specialist of a, um, urban foresight and I've done, a, uh, I've done a extended uh, future research project on the future of the greater Paris. So I'm quite informed on the future of Paris uh, as well. But who was speaking? Well, yeah, it was me. So, uh, Raphael, welcome to the conversation. So, it, it's what we were talking about is um, how do we, or how could there be an infrastructure in place to mitigate the damage that technology has in cities or makes in cities? And um, we gave the, well, I gave the example of Paris banning Uber, and I'm not sure how accurate that is. But um, I, I know there's a, there's a, another app called Captain that basically started just because of U Uber wasn't allowed to function in, in uh, Paris or whatever. So um, it, it's more about like how did um, Paris or how has Paris uh, kind of intervened in disruptive technology and not allowed it to disrupt in, in, in the way maybe the, uh, the uh, creators intended? Well, uh, the, the disruption by technology are on urban functions is exactly what's going on in the economy at large. So yes, there is some new platform that facilitate a new way of working. The case of cabs, it's a cabs versus Uber. It's an example. And we've, we've even invented the term of Uberization of economy because of that specific case, but it's actually, a not, it's just a new way of working, a new way of doing things. You know, the principle of a platform is not that you define a function, but you create an infrastructure so that communities can do it by themselves and get, and, and, and be in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, economy. Uh, this model, uh, it is on one hand, it is disruptive in the cases of Uber. We can see that it's damaging the uh, taxi classic economy, but it could be also a way of a, uh, having more collaborative governance to have urban commons. So it's not the, te the technology in itself. It's more like, you know, people having some ideas about how to uh, use that way of uh, working and apply it to the, it's applied to urban functions, it's applying to health, to education. So this is, a, you know, the, the last generation of our technology has allowed those mechanisms to work. So now it's about using them well. And now we see our uh, collaborative governance emerging from those platforms. And this is quite promising for politicians and it can be very inclusive as well. So it's not about judging technology. It's more like taking a position of also promoting and supporting people who are using those technology in an inclusive way, I would say, you know, it's because there is also some amazing, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Michel Bowens, who is like a very iconic thinker of the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, economy and, uh, and urban commons. And um, we, we wrote together an article recently and his pages are, you know, it's hundreds of examples of people using technology to serve urban inclusion. Uh, um, and so uh, we could be, uh, and I, I will be joining um, uh, Michelle's discourse on technology also that we had a, very a really interesting exchange this morning. Technology is not, or, you know, it's too easy to, to put all the pressure on, uh, on technology. Uh, that's my perception. And then uh, uh, if, I, if I can comment on what's going on as, at the moment on uh, urban transformation, it's true that uh, the design of new infrastructures that's where the core transformation is at the moment. Like there is a shift, whether it's for governance, for um, uh, social inclusion, but it's also for the uh, environmental transition, the shift to low carbon uh, energy, mobility, um, communication, uh, public services at large. So there is a big focus on infrastructure at the moment. 
and uh, um, digital infrastructure will be the one uh, um, that will that might be capturing all the value in a way. So this is like a, a, an area focused, maybe a comment to envisioning with the platform with your um, future of cities platform have a focus specifically on on the topic of infrastructure could be an interesting highlight uh, as a as a I don't know if it's one of your category, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's one of the key topic at the moment. Like uh, five years ago, I would have say it's more like the 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 the, the change of social use. But yeah, now the the new frontier is very much on the infrastructures. And uh, it can be also like our, you know, uh, public transportation infrastructures. Uh, if they are smart enough to be, you know, to think data-wise rather than just machine-wise. And uh, um, yeah, that's uh, because uh, the, the 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 war is on data. Yeah, I would just like to add like that uh, is also something that came from this conversation on technology. Once the, the genie is out of the bottle, once the idea is out there, like it's very hard to, to banish. So even if Paris banishes uh, Uber, something else will, will show up and fill the void. Then maybe like doing uh, some, some work around the, the legislation or just being local already solves the problem. But like what, what we can see so far is that even when you you block some things from happening uh, through legislation, what happens is that some work around comes and someone makes that idea happen. Might not be the same as the, the original, but uh, it happens uh, nonetheless. Uh, I think we we are uh, going towards like a closing. Um, I would uh, ask again, like if anyone has like any interesting sources to share with the group. Uh, would be cool if you could uh, do it in the chat as well. So we have like exchange links and stuff. I see people are, are already giving them co their contacts. Uh, we want to uh, do the maximum we can uh, to share what we are collecting here with all the present people. Uh, but again, like I would like to invite anyone who wants to, to share their sources, their, their viewpoints uh, with the group. Yeah, and also that we're still starting out the first day and we have two and a half days ahead of us of, of additional sessions. So this one is very particular around cities, but we're gonna be deconstructing time with Gustavo who's on the line. We're gonna be uh, working uh, on our personal digital identities later tomorrow. We're gonna be talking about our methodologies. We're gonna have a similar round table later today, if I'm not mistaken, on, um, on technology foresight in general. So same setup. Um, but speaking about how we track technology, how we learn about technology, not so much for in an urban environment, but, but more in general, um, sort of between practitioners. Uh, there's a packed schedule ahead and you all know where to sign up. And I know a bunch of you are already signed up to several other sessions, but it would be remiss if I didn't mention it. Um, and uh, do feel free to add your links or emails to the chat so other people can see you. Um, and with that, we're going to be wrapping up in a few minutes. Um, if someone has parting words or wants to show their city on the webcam, now would be a good time. I'm putting the, my website on the, on, the, on the chat if people are interested in their, uh, reading publication and the conferences I've done on, their, on Future of Cities. Uh, you can uh, you can check that, but maybe we can go deeper on that topic, Michelle, another time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for showing up. And you also have another session today or tomorrow, uh, Rafael. Uh, I have two uh, sessions tomorrow. I have a session tomorrow morning at uh, 11, from 11 to 11:45. I'm inviting a uh, uh, few companies to discuss weak signal research, um, how it's an appropriate uh, for future research method. Uh, in front of emergencies such as the COVID, in front of tra transition, but also uh, to feed innovation. So weak signal research is tomorrow 11. Uh, it's all on the website. Huh? So uh, on the front page, you'll see the, the three meeting points. So tomorrow morning, weak signal, and tomorrow afternoon, I have a session with the Foresight Journal 
um, and it's a session about uh, the bridges between uh, uh, art design, um, urban design, science fiction, and foresight. So I will be talking, I will be the, the speaker for the bridge between art and uh, foresight. Voila, so please join. Exciting. How is everyone else finding the summit? Because I've only been in our room, so I haven't seen much else. Uh, but how are you guys finding the experience, the UNESCO summit in general? Yeah, if no one wants to go, uh, it's it's really cool. Thank you for doing this. It's uh, it's really valuable. Um, the one thing I would say is um, uh, just accessing the rooms. I've had delays in both sessions accessing the rooms, so. Um, I, I guess you guys are just learning as you go, so uh, like that might be worth looking at. So ju just to access the room straight away as soon as we start. But apart from that, it's amazing, really, really uh, uh, it, it, intelligent, interesting concepts being thrown around. I'm learning a lot. Thank you so much. Um, that access to room, just to be very specific, because we're also bumping into tech issues, and that's the last thing we admit to having as a tech company. So uh, wh where exactly was that friction? Was that between the UNESCO uh, and the signups, or was it after Eventbrite, or was it Eventbrite to Zoom, just so we can pinpoint it? Would like me to message you direct, as opposed to have a whole conversation about it? Let's do that. Thank you. OK. Well, with that, thank you so much. Um, we're going to start wrapping up. And um, it was lovely having this conversation. Thanks to all the listeners and thanks to everyone who's, who's, who's been active through the chat. We know there's a bunch of you who cannot show your faces right now, but who are still uh, present. And uh, oh, we have someone joining us from uh, Blade Runner. Um, hi, Ryan. And uh, we are wrapping up. And, um, but I'll, we'll, we'll see you in upcoming sessions. Again, long schedule ahead of us. And I uh, hope to see more of you in other conversations. Everyone has posted their links and their emails and their chats. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your attention. Ciao, bye.